There's going to be times in your life where things twist in a manner that's unfair to you, that you're not getting your just desserts. But that goes along with all sorts of unequally distributed privileges as well. And so that's the arbitrary nature of existence. And, but, but you can't allow those sorts of things to define you because it's not, it's not that useful strategically. You're, when you're playing a card game, you're dealt a, you're dealt a hand of cards. Yep. Well, what do you do? You play the hand the best you can. Why? Because all the, all the hands are equal? No. Because you don't have a better strategy than playing the hand that you're dealt the best you can. And that doesn't even mean it'll be a winning strategy. But because people don't always win. Sometimes we lose and sometimes we lose painfully and sometimes we lose painfully and unjustly. Hmm. That's not the point. The point is you don't have a better strategy and neither does anyone else. And then it's also not so obvious how privilege and victimization are distributed. You know, if you take someone who's doing quite well in life and you scratch underneath the surface, you generally don't have to scratch very far until you find one or more profound tragedies of the past or perhaps of the present. Now, when, no matter how well protected you are in the world, you're still subject to illness, you're still subject to aging, you're still subject to the dissolution of your relationships, the death of your dreams, death itself. So, vulnerability is built into the structure of existence. Now, if you start to regard yourself as a hapless victim, or even worse, an unfairly victimized victim, well, then things go very badly sideways for you. It's not a good strategy. You end up resentful. You end up angry. You end up vengeful. You end up hostile. And, and that's just the beginning. Things can get far more out of hand than that. So strategically, it's a bad game. It's better to take responsibility for the hand that you've been dealt. The major advantage, I think, to, to, to making a case very strongly that one of the fundamental realities of life is its suffering is that it's actually a relief to people to hear that. Because they suspect it. Well, they know it. But no one's forthright about it. It's like, yeah, life is suffering. Okay, fine. So where does that leave us? Well, here's where it leaves us. It turns out that even though life is suffering, if you're sufficiently um, courageous and forthright and honest, let's say, in your approach, and you don't shy away, what you'll find is that there's something within you that will respond to the challenge of suffering with the development of ability that will transcend the suffering. So the pessimism is, yeah, well, life is rife with problems at every level. But the upside is, if you turn and confront that voluntarily, that you'll find something in yourself that can develop and master that. And so the, the, the optimism is nested in the pessimism. And that's extremely helpful to people, especially people who are struggling because they think, oh my God, life is so difficult. I don't know if I can stand this. There must be something wrong with me. Does anybody else feel this way? And you can say, yes, everyone feels that way at some time. But that's, and, and, and it is as bad as you think, but you're more than you think you are. You're more than you think you are. You have to work to take care of yourself and what you want, say, in this moment. But then there's you tomorrow and there's you next week, and there's you next month, and next year, and 10 years from now, and when you're old. So because you're self-conscious, and because you're aware of the future, you're actually a community unto yourself. And if you're selfish and impulsive, all that means is that you're serving the person you are right now, you know, in that impulsive way, but not the person you're going to be. And so that's not a good grounds for any sort of ethical behavior. And I see that if you serve yourself properly, there's no difference between that and serving your family properly and serving your community properly. That Those things all mesh in a kind of a harmonious manner. The antidote to the meaninglessness of their life and the suffering and the malevolence that they might be displaying because they're resentful and bitter about how things have turned out. The antidote to that is to take on more responsibility for themselves and for other people. And that that's aspirational, which is kind of cool. You know, the conservative types, the duty types, and I'm not complaining about them, you know, they're always basically saying, well, this is how you should act, because in some sense, that's your duty, right? That's how a good citizen would act. And that's a reasonable argument. But the case that I've been making is more that, well, there is a there is value distinctions between things. Some things are worth doing and some things aren't. And you can kind of discover what that is for yourself. And then you should aim at the things that are most worth doing. And what you'll find if you watch carefully is that the things that you find worth doing are almost always associated with an Im 
increase in responsibility. Because if you think about the people you admire, for example, you spontaneously admire people, and that's a manifestation of the instinct to imitate. Again, people are very imitative. You don't admire people who don't take care of themselves. Like, unless there's something wrong with you, you, you at least want an admirable person to be accountable for themselves. And then if they've got something left over so they can be accountable for their family, well, then that's a net plus, obviously. That's someone you think is solid. And then maybe they take care of some more people. They have a business or they're involved in the community in some positive way. You see, well, that's a person whose pattern of being is worth imitating. And so, and that's all associated with responsibility. And it's so interesting because it's as if, it's as if everybody kind of knows this, but that it hasn't crystallized. It's like, well, you should be responsible because that's what a good citizen is. It's not, no, no, you should be responsible because you need to have a deep meaning in your life to offset the suffering so you don't get bitter. And the way you do that is to bear a heavy load, you know, to get yourself in, in check for you now and for you in the future, and then to do the same for your family and your community, and that there's real nobility in that, and there's real meaning. And more, the other thing that I've been suggesting to people, and I also believe this, is that, and I think that the guys that have come to talk to me, especially the ones that have had real, real rough lives, they really understand this. If you don't get your act together and you let yourself slide, then what kind of moves in to take the place of what you could have been is something that's really not good at all. So it's not only that if you're living a, like a dissolute life that you're not aiming at anything positive and so you don't have any real meaning and you're subsumed by anxiety and all of that and hopelessness but something kind of hellish moves in there too to to occupy that place and so then you end up making things worse and when you know one of the things i learned about studying totalitarian systems whether they were on the right or the left was that part of the reason that the totalitarian horrors of the 20th century manifested themselves was because average people didn't take on the proper responsibility. They shut their eyes when their eyes should have been open, even though they knew it. And they did and said things they knew they shouldn't have done and said. And that was what supported those horrible systems. So, you know, if you don't get your act together, then you leave a little space for hell. And I really believe that. You have a moral obligation to be strong and dangerous, both of those. But to harness that and to use it in the service of good. So it, it's... It, it's, it's associated with a complex set of ideas. We wouldn't have to think if empathy guided us properly, but it doesn't. It guides us properly in some very specific conditions. It can also make us very dangerous because, and there's good, there's good experimental literature on this, if you're very sensitive to an in-group's claims, whatever they might be, that makes you very hostile to perceived out-group members. You know, so empathy drives that in-group identification. It's like, okay, well, what about the out-group? Oh, those are predatory. Those are predators. We better be hard on them. You know, it's, it's a mother bear's compassion that gets you eaten. So we can't be thinking that empathy is an untrammeled virtue. There's no, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. The psychoanalysts knew this perfectly well as well when we were still wise enough to, to attend to their more profound realizations. And that's the motif of the devouring parent, the devouring mother is the, is the more general trope. And that's someone who will do absolutely everything for you all the time so that you never have to rely on yourself for anything. That's not good. No, there's rules, for example, if you're dealing with the elderly in an old folks home, here's a rule. Never do anything for one of your clients they can do themselves. Why? Because they're already struggling with the loss of their independence. And you want to help them maintain that independence as long as possible. And that might mean sitting by while someone struggles to do up their buttons, for example. When you can, and this is the same if you're maybe helping your three-year-old dress themselves. It's like, yeah, yeah, you can put on the buttons a lot faster. Let me help you with that. It's like, no, you struggle with that. You master it. And I'll, I'll keep my empathy to myself. Thank you very much. So that I can help you maintain your independence is exactly why I think that what I'm talking about is falling on receptive ears is because you actually cannot have a prolonged discussion of rights without having an equally prolonged discussion of responsibilities for a variety of reasons. First of all, the actual reason that you have rights is so that you can discharge your responsibilities. It's not the other way around. It's like you're granted rights by everyone around you or, or no, it's not granted exactly. It's part of the, part of the the purpose of your rights, in some sense, is so that you can be given an autonomous space that's protected, 
in which you can manifest what's necessary about you in the world that's a contribution to it. So I have to leave a space for you so that you can make your contribution for yourself, so you can take care of yourself, so that you can shoulder responsibility for your family, and so that you can serve the community the best way that you can. And I don't, I don't want to set up a society that will interfere with that. But then, and then there's the association that we already talked about between res responsibility and meaning, which yeah. is absolutely crucial. And so it's, the responsibility element is more important than the rights element, as far as I'm concerned, or it certainly is at this point in time. So and people know this. They it, instinctively know it. 